Greetings, happy coders, and welcome back to our journey through Osborne Books, Introduction to Machine Code for Beginners. In this episode, we're going to take a look at screen memory and how we can print a character to screen. Now, obviously, there is a part within the Osborne Books which talks about getting to know your computer's memory, and uh, that is mentioned here, as you can see. But that's all we're going to do from Usborne today, because what we're going to do now is look at the screen memory and look at the particular details that make the spectrum so, shall we say, unique. So alongside learning to use binary and hexadecimal, which we covered quite extensively in the first few episodes, I would say that understanding the way the spectrum screen memory works is one of the barriers that some people struggle to overcome when it comes to coding in machine language because although it's not entirely illogical, it's probably not what you would expect, and it's not really designed for writing games. So as strange as it sounds now, the Spectrum was originally intended as a business machine, and as we'll see today, the way that the screen memory is laid out is much more geared to working with text and business applications than it is for writing games. So if you're coding in BASIC, or if you're using a game engine, like uh, AGD or AGDX or something like that, then you are just working with the screen coordinates and the interpreter will do the calculations for you and work out where you want to put things. But when you're coding in assembly, you need to know a bit more about how to make those calculations yourself. And that's what puts people off, I suppose. It's maths, so. Um, but it's not too tricky, I promise. We'll go through it step by step and uh, we'll look at the basics and hopefully you'll begin to get the idea and once you get the idea um, there are a few tricks that you can use and, and as you learn you'll find uh, that you get used to it really it's never going to be ideal but as i said people have written thousands of games and so i'm sure that you can overcome these hurdles just as well as they did so in the previous very simple demo that we made in the last episode where we set up the code environment, created a binary, we saw that by putting a single byte into screen memory, we can change the configuration of eight individual pixels on the screen. Eight pixels, eight bits, one byte. Now, which eight pixels we change, obviously in this example, we started just with the very top left-hand corner, but if we change the address of where we're gonna put that byte, obviously we're gonna change a different set of eight pixels. So let's look now at how we might print a whole eight by eight character onto the screen. And here's an example that I've made, and this is in uh, Excel. As you can see, there are eight rows and each row has eight pixels. And we know from our previous episode, we can represent those eight pixels in each row by a single byte that we send to the screen. And of course, each of these pixels is going to be represented by a binary number 0 or 1. So let's look across and see how this image would be represented as byte data. Firstly, by just putting a 0 on a 1 on each pixel. So as you can see here, this face now is made up of 8 binary numbers, 8 bits each. So we can represent this face as binary numbers. And if you look closely at the, these zeros and ones here, you should still be able to make out the face in that list of numbers. Now, the other thing I've done here, as you can see, is I've added the percentage prefix, which will tell our assembler when we use this data that we're using binary here. And after that, I've also converted them into both hex and decimal so that you can see how that works as well. And of course, we've covered all of that in previous episodes. So if you haven't done that, then you should go back and make sure you understand how that works. Okay, so to sum it up, these eight numbers represent the eight values that we need to draw this face onto the screen. So we're going to have to put these eight numbers into the screen memory in the right place. And hopefully that will mean that we will then get the face on the screen. So what will happen is the ULA, which obviously scans the screen memory, will pick them up, change that into visual signals that it then sends to the monitor so that we get the visual information. And that will mean that our face will appear. And again, if you're not sure what I mean when I say ULA, go back and watch the previous episodes. So we have our data. Now we need to know where to put it. In order to do that, we need to know a little bit more about the spectrum screen memory. Logically, you'd imagine that the screen memory is linear. That is to say, it would just go across line by line by line. And there are some computers which do that. I think the Acon Atom, for example. However, 
as you probably know from watching a screen loader load in from cassette, it doesn't load in in a top to bottom way. It loads in in that classic spectrum way that I'm sure we're all familiar with. So when it comes to managing the layout of a screen like that, if you want to have sprites moving around, it can be a little bit tricky. The best way to begin is to begin by simply printing 8x8 eight eight characters into a character grid in a similar way that we would if we were printing text. So that's the first thing that we can learn to understand about the screen memory. Once we get the hang of that, then later on, perhaps, we can start thinking about how we can sort of move beyond that into sprites and so on. Okay, so let's start by looking at the whole screen. The Spectrum, of course, evolved from its older brother, the ZX81, and was designed first and foremost to be used with standard televisions of that time, which had a ratio, that is to say, the horizontal to the vertical ratio of 4 to 3. So knowing what we know about 8-bit numbers, it therefore makes sense that the pixel resolution for the spectrum would be 256 by 192. So it maintains the same ratio as the TV that it was intended for. And of course, we have a range with binary from 0 to 255. So that's the maximum number, that's the maximum 8-bit number that we can use that would give us a ratio of 4 to 3 that would fit the TV that it was intended for. Now, since we know that our character squares are 8 pixels by 8 pixels wide and high, then all we need to do is to determine the character resolution is to divide that pixel resolution, 256 by 192, divide both of those numbers by 8, and that would tell us the resolution of the 8 by 8 characters. And that resolution, of course, much like the ZX81, is 32 columns and 24 rows. So that's just 256 divided by 8, that's 32, and 192 divided by 8, that's 24. And that gives us the same ratio as we had before, 4 to 3. So 32 by 24, that gives us a total, multiply those together, 768 total character squares on one screen. So since each character requires 8 bytes, we can therefore calculate that the total memory space occupied by pixel data is 6144 bytes, or 6K. Bear in mind, we're not thinking about color just yet, just pure pixels. And as I said, those bytes are not stored top to bottom in a completely linear way, so let's look at how it's done. The first thing to understand is the screen memory is divided into three separate sections, each one being 32 characters wide by 8 characters high. Now that might seem a little strange, but it isn't a coincidence because 32 multiplied by 8 is 256, and that's our magic number. As we know, that's our 8-bit limit. So what we're doing here now is we're dividing up our screen into three areas, each of which is 256 characters. What that means is that we can reference each character square with a unique 8-bit number. Now that will be important a little bit later when we look at how the screen memory is laid out. But first, let's just look at the segment of 256 characters. Each of those characters, of course, has 8 bytes. So that tells us that the total memory of this particular segment, of each segment, is 256 times 8, 2048 bytes, or 2K. And that is, of course, one-third of our original value, 6144. Now, if we look at that in hexadecimal, we'll see that it is 0800 bytes. We know from our previous episode that the top segment in memory, screen memory, begins at 4000. So that's where we know our top segment begins. That's the top of the screen. 16384 in decimal. Now, if you take a look at this illustration, you'll see that the middle section starts at 4800, which would make sense because we know the size of a segment in hexadecimal is 0800 bytes. So we're adding 2k in decimal to that value. And that means that the middle section starts at 4800 and the third segment starts at 5000. And you can see the decimal equivalence here as well. In terms of how these segments are laid out, that at least is linear. We've got three different chunks of memory, if you like, and each of those is 2K in size. One of them is at 4000, one of them is at 4800, and one of them is at 500. 
zero, zero. And when you look at it again, this shows the benefit of working in hexadecimal. You can actually see that these are actually very round numbers in terms of hexadecimal. When you look at them in decimal, it can be quite confusing, but it's easier, I think, to understand them in hexadecimal. And that's why hexadecimal is so useful when it comes to working with this kind of data. So what we can say in summary then is we have three segments. The top segment has addresses 4000 to 47FF, the middle segment 4800 to 4FFF, and the bottom segment has address 500 to 57FF. Simple enough, I hope. Now, the tricky non-linear part comes when we look inside each segment. The memory addresses within each segment are not organized line by line, as we already mentioned. What they are organized by is character square. You'll remember when I said we could reference each of these character squares individually. Well, let's do that. Take a look here. We'll give each one of them a number. Okay, so let's imagine each one of these within the segment. We start from the very top left corner here, and that number is 00. zero. And from the bottom right of the segment, that one is FF, obviously, because that's 255 in decimal. So let's pick one of these squares arbitrarily. Let's say, for example, we'll look at B4. Now, we know within each character square there are 8 bytes because it's an 8 by 8 square. So you can see that here. Each one of these bytes is stored in a 16-bit address in the memory. Each address, of course, as we know, has a low byte and a high byte. So let's take a look at the 8 memory addresses that make up this square. And that should help us to understand how the spectrum memory is laid out. So here are our eight memory addresses with the high byte and the low byte. The first thing you'll probably notice is that the low byte of every address in this square is the same, and it matches the number in our grid. So in other words, when drawing in any particular square, when you're sticking within that square, the low byte of the address, of the screen address, doesn't change and it corresponds to its position within the 32 by 8 segment. So all 8 bytes within this square will have an address that ends in B4, because this one is square B4. Now take a look at the high byte. As we know, this segment contains addresses from 4000 to 47FF. Note then that the high byte for each line within the segment is linear going from 4,0 at the top to 4,7 at the bottom, 4,0, 4,1, 4,2, and so on. So as we move down within a single character square, the high byte increases by 1 each time, and that's 8 bytes. So although in summary it does seem quite convoluted, getting the memory address to print an 8 by 8 character actually only requires two steps. And uh, I've made a little sheet here in Excel. It's actually an open office, but um, same difference, really. I'll make this available for you so that you can download it and, and have a play about with it. The only two things that we really need to know when we're drawing a character is we need to know which segment and we need to know which character within that segment. So when we pick the segment, it will either be 40, 48, or 50. That will be the top byte of our character, depending on whether it's in the top segment, the middle segment, or the lower segment. And then the low byte will always match the character square that we're looking at here. And the sheet that I've got here allows you to change those two values. You can pick a segment, 0, 1, or 2, meaning top, middle, and lower, and then you can change the byte, and then it would give you the eight addresses that you need to print to that particular square. Now, again, just want to stress, obviously, when we're working with games and other things like that, we're not going to be working within these character squares. We're going to be moving things from left to right, up and down, pixel by pixel. That's obviously a lot more complicated. But our aim here, really, is just for you to get a feel of how the, and why the spectrum memory is laid out in this way. And uh, there's no denying it. It's, it's not ideal, but it is what it is. Now, before we move over to the assembly code, let's actually look to do this with it using pokes because then we can get a better feel for the memory and how it works. As you can see, we've got our little image here, and on the left side, we've got the calculations for the screen addresses, and you can see those there. There are eight of those, of course. And on the right-hand side, you can see 
that this is the binary and calculated into decimal for the image data. So all we need to do is to poke the addresses that we have here on the left with the values that we have on the right. So manually, I suppose you would say, we can manually poke this data in the same way that the uh, CPU will do in assembly. And obviously, CPU is going to be a much, much quicker than we can do it. But it's a good way to learn. So what I've done is I've created a little formula here that lists the necessary pokes that we need to test this out. So if you have a chance to download this, then obviously do that and you can have a play about with it. And we'll put a value into it now and we'll go over to the emulator. Let's take a look at that. OK, so here we've got uh, side by side. I've got uh, emulator spectaculator here and I've got a little table over here. And as you can see, I've set it up to be in square B4 and it's calculated the memory addresses that we've already seen here. And here's our little character that we worked on. And here's the binary and here's the hex and here's the decimal. And here is a list of pokes that will help us to understand how the memory works. Again, of course, this isn't a practical thing. It's purely a learning tool. But as you can see, if I now go through and start putting these pokes in, Okay, it starts there. Okay, so there you go. That was incredibly slow, but I hope that shows you how the screen memory work. So of course, obviously, if I wanted to, if I wanted to change it, I could put um, a one in here. So now instead, it's going to be printing in the middle section. And notice how this number changes 48, 49, 48, and so on. If I change it back to zero, that's going to change to 404. And then of course, if I change it to a two, it will change from 50, 50 to 57 depending on the section. So let's say middle section. And then if I put another number in here, just just pick any old random number, let's say um, a three like that. And there you go. And obviously that's going to print here. I'm not going to bore you to death with printing the whole thing. But let's just print the top the top number there poke. Now it will be poke one eight five there and you can see that's where a3 would be and if we look back on the grid we would see that that matched now before we continue i'm going to interrupt the program for a shameless plug i love making these videos and doing my bit to keep the community going but they do take many hours of work and there's only so much time i can spare because i have to do real life work to keep the wolves from the door, so to speak. So that's why I give you guys a few options to chip in and help if you like the work and you can afford it. Firstly, of course, it's great if you can just like and subscribe the video and share it. Secondly, you can go to my itch.io page, here's the link, and donate whilst downloading a game. If you prefer, you can go to Ko-Fi, and here's that link, throw a few pennies in the jar. And finally, of course, if you want to get the warmest glow possible, you can support me regularly on Patreon, where you get all my games for free, and it helps to free up more of my time so I can keep making stuff like this. Thanks a lot, and let's get back to work. So if we look back at the image here that we made earlier, and we can see here that we've got the binary, and I've also converted it into hex and decimal. So let's take the hexadecimal data because it's a little less cumbersome than the binary. Of course, you could use binary if you wanted to maybe edit it because you can edit it pixel by pixel. When you use binary, you can kind of tweak it. But in this case, we're not going to make any kind of changes. So we'll take the hex and we're going to put that into our code now. Okay, so here we are in the code. Now, obviously, right here, we've got a ret statement here, which is going to end our code. So our program is going to start here and then we're going to run through these instructions and then it's going to go back to basic. So what that means is that we can store our data after our program 
and then it won't clash with our program because the program counter will never reach that part of the code. It's important to keep those two things separate because obviously if the program counter enters an area where there is data, it will interpret that as instructions and it will just be random instructions and it will almost certainly cause some kind of a crash. So we want to keep that separate. That's what we're doing here. Okay, so below there, we're going to start off and we'll put a label. We'll call it smiley here. Now labels, we don't need to indent. Instructions are indented like this, but labels, no indent. It's generally a good idea to put the colon in there as well, just to make a distinction. And you can start a new line like this if you want to, and then follow your data here. But you don't have to with data. Entirely up to you. When you're using labels within, alongside instructions, it can be useful to, uh, to just to kind of separate the code out a little bit. Okay, so the next thing we do is we just type def b. Def b is a little bit like a data statement. It tells the assembler that this is just data. You don't need to assemble it into any kind of instruction. Now, I've got the data stored in the clipboard, so I'm just going to paste that in here like this. There you go. So those are the eight bytes that we need for our smiley face and we now have them stored after our program and we know that we can reference them here and we'll call that smiley. Okay, so this part of the code we don't need anymore. So we'll take that out and let's start writing a new program. So what are we doing here? Basically, we are going to copy information from the address here, smiley, onto the screen in the correct order. So we need to decide where we're going to print it to. So let's say we're going to print it somewhere in the middle of the screen. So we'll choose the middle segment and we'll start at 48. That's the high byte, as you remember. Let's say we put it at 90. And of course, I need to write load HL 4890 like that. So I'm loading the screen address that we want to print to into the registers H and L, which work together as a 16-bit address, 4890, which is where our screen memory, the position that we want to print at, is held, just like this. Okay. Now I'm going to load the other register pair, another register pair, DE, and I'm going to load that with smiley, like that. Okay. So what that means now is the CPU has got two addresses in its uh, local memory. It's got the screen address 4890, and it's got the address of our data, which is here. Next thing we do then is we just load the accumulator with the value that's held in DE, like that. And that's going to read that byte right here. And then all we need to do is load oops, load the address and obviously we put this in brackets so that means load the memory with the memory address rather than the the uh, register with the value of the accumulator so all we're doing here very similar to what we did before but now we're reading data so we read this value here we put it into uh, HL and then it will be on the screen effectively okay so what do we do next? Obviously, we need to go to the next value. So to do that, we're going to go increase inc de, just like that. Now, we're going to use a 16-bit increase. So rather than just say inc e, we'll do inc de just to be on the safe side, because there is a possibility that our data here might be crossing over between uh, 256, 255 and on to 0. So if you imagine we've got in memory, we've got chunks of 0 to 255, so we don't want to overlap and go back. So we're going to do a 16-bit increase, so we'll use inc de. In other words, when e gets to 255, it will go back to 0, but then it will also increase d. So that's what we need to do there. We're going to move across. Now we know that de is now at smiley plus 1 here. Now, remembering what we know from the screen memory, we don't need to change, because we're only printing in a character square, we don't need to change L here. L is 9, 0. We don't need to change it. All we have to do is increase H. So we'll go like this, inc H, just like that. 
and we're now ready to print the next value. Now, obviously, if we were working with basic, we might we might well say, well, let's just loop back and repeat. And we can do that, of course, but we haven't learned about that yet. So what we're going to do is we're just going to step through it one by one. And then later on, perhaps we'll look at uh, how we could make a loop. We'll probably do that in the next episode. Right. So right now, all we need to do is just repeat this, this section here, another seven times. Okay, so we'll just move that down like that. And uh, what I'll do actually, let's just make some comments. It's always good to make sure that you annotate everything because when you come back and you can't remember what you've done, say you've done some code and then you've left it for a month or two, it's always good to keep track. It's also good for other people to help them to learn. So here we'll start, we'll just say uh, store screen address here. Okay, and store source, load source, copy to screen, next source byte. next line of char character right there we go good okay so we don't need to load hl and de a second time so this is the only part that we need where it's copying and, in and then increasing all right so we'll do that that's the first line that will be our second line and then we'll that will take us to the third line so that's our third line like that and then fourth fifth line and that's our eighth line there of course we don't need to increase de and ink h here because that's the last byte and that's the bottom line we don't need to go down again so we don't need to do that we'll just tidy up and there we go and that's our routine and obviously this is quite long for what it is and we would normally use a loop but this is just as i said teaching tools and uh, essentially that's it. Now, before we start, we're just gonna make a couple more small changes. I think we'll call this demo two, just so that we don't overwrite our previous one. And then the other thing I've done here is I've added something to the executive execute plugin. So as before, we would press F6 or go to here, execute. Now you'll notice that I've made a couple of changes here. I've added a thing here which just says dash LST equals name part dot text and here MPP open name part dot text. So what this is doing essentially is creating a text file and then opening it. And that text file is generated by SJM plus and it is a list. And uh, this list is going to show us the results of our assembly in such a way that we can see the binary. Um, I beg your pardon, we can see the hexadecimal code and we can see the assembler language and we can see where it ends up in memory. It'll become clear when I run it. Okay, so let's run it now and we'll see that a text file will open. Bearing in mind, as it says here, remember, starting at 800, loading in the data and so on. So let's run it now. There we go and we have no errors, so that's good. And we'll just reload that just to make sure because I did it once before, before recording. And here, this is a list. This is just a summary. But again, it's a good educational and debugging tool. As you can see, we're loading the memory address in here. And here, where it says load smiley, that's our source code. This is how that turns out in the Spectrum's memory at this address, 8003. And as you can see here, these two numbers correspond if we scroll down to the address here. So we have our low byte 25 and our high byte 80 here. And uh, when the code reads it, it reads it low byte first and then high byte. And that's why that address there is 9048 and this one's 2580. Okay, so it's loading it in there. And then as you can see, it's gonna increase it, keep going. And that's our data. And as you can see here, it hasn't assembled this into code. It's just taken it as data here, so it's not broken up the way that these are. 
into different lines. Okay, so as I said, that's just a way for us to have a look at the demo and uh, see how it's uh, made up rather than looking at it within the debugger itself so we can basically run it more easily. Okay, so let's um, jump over now and uh, we'll bring this in. Here it is, Spectaculator this time. And we're going to go to open a file. This, here we go, and we've got demo2 here. So we'll open that up and we'll load it at 32768. We're not going to run it because we want to run it directly from basic. So 32768, there we go. And now let's just do the, the old randomize USR 768. We should get a smiley face appearing somewhere around about here. Let's take a look. Uh huh, not a bad guess. That was pretty close, wasn't I? So there you go. So that's run through the code and printed our smiley face exactly where we wanted it. We can, of course, just jump back here. And uh, if we want to print it in a different place, let's say we want to print it in the third segment. There we go, five zero. And then we could change this number. So remember, this number can be either 4048 or 50. That's our choosing the segment. And then this number here can be anything from 0 to 256 within the character square. So um, let's just put another random number in like this. And uh, if we run that, do the same thing again. Oops, let me press F6, not F5. Oh, there we go. OK, and we'll run that. And it's gonna. We'll just choose reload because it was already open. So that's that. And uh, we can just jump back to Spectaculator here. And we can now open this demo again, like that. And we're not going to be clearing the screen, so we'll just go randomize again. We'll run the code. It's different code now. It's been overwritten. And now we should get uh, a face somewhere on the bottom segment there. And there it is. There you go. Okay, so you can have a play about with this. Combine this exercise with the exercise that um, with the with the Excel sheet that I showed you. You can figure out where you want to put the put the image. And incidentally, um, you can actually change the data on the Excel sheet uh, by writing zero or one within that sheet. You can actually edit it yourself. Yeah, you can actually, if you want to, you can just type numbers into here. So why don't we change it? Let's uh, let's change it. Let's give him an, uh, a frown instead. Let's turn that smile upside down. Right. So if we give him a face like that, well, that would do, wouldn't it? Actually, that kind of shocked or angry face. Um, good enough. Maybe we'll just yeah, that will do, won't it? Okay, and uh, as you can see, the binary is updated and the hex is updated as well. So what I'll do, you can't actually see me doing this right now, but you have to trust me there. I'm going to go back into the code. Let's go back into the code over here. This is our data, and this is our Excel data here. Okay, so we're going to just replace this data like so. It's pretty straightforward. Some of them didn't need to be changed, of course, but anyway, it's all part of the fun, isn't it? Right, okay, there we go. And we'll remove that. Replace it with our new data. Okay. And uh, do we want to print it? Let's print it in the top part of the screen. So we'll change that to full zero. Let's just Let's use 90. That will mean it will appear in the top segment in the same position um, within the segment as the middle one did. Okay, so we just press F6. Run that code. We can load that back in. Jump into Spectaculator. Let's load our demo. Oops, no, we want load demo 2. Okay, let's run that. So that's been loaded, and then we just randomize again, like that. And there you go, and that's exactly what we would expect, as predicted, lined up there within the segment. 
Okay, so we're really getting somewhere, aren't we? That's pretty fun. I think you guys can have a play about with that, see what you can learn, and uh, perhaps in the next episode we'll look at how to uh, make this a little more simple by using loops and uh, using flags. So look forward to that, probably back in another week or two. And uh, as always, happy coding. Bye-bye. This video would not be possible without the amazing contributions from the people whose names you can see scrolling up the screen right now. I really am flattered that they would be willing to support what I do, and I really can't thank them enough for the encouragement. So, if you'd like to join them, you'll get all my games for free, you get some input into projects which I work on, and by chipping in a little each month, you'll also be helping to buy me a little more time to dedicate to videos like this. The link to my Patreon page is in the description below, so please head on over there if you'd like to help. And in the meantime, as always, happy coding. Bye-bye.